where the Arabian desert reaches the sea, the wind brings sandstorms to scour the land. But every year there comes a different wind. It whips up the Indian Ocean and transforms land and sea alike. They call it the Karif, the wind of plenty. Behind the southern coast of Oman, bare rocky hills look out towards the Indian Ocean. This is the other Arabian desert, not rolling sand dunes, but sun-baked stone. It's a harsh and arid place where water is almost unknown. Once every year, near the coast, the Karif arrives to begin the annual transformation of land and sea. Instead of sandstorms, this wind brings mist. In the space of a few days, the dusty ground is covered with fresh grass. Trees put out their leaves and dormant flowering plants begin to form buds. The trees trap the moisture in the breeze. The Karif is a warm, damp wind sweeping in from the southwest across the Indian Ocean. The mist condenses on the leaves and twigs of the trees or on the moss on their branches and from there it drips down to quench the thirsty ground. The local people are quick to bring out their cattle to feed on the fresh grass. From mid-June to mid-September, the Karif roars in. It brings new life to the sea as well. The warm water along the shore is swept away to be replaced by cold water, rich in nutrients, welling up from the depths of the Indian Ocean. The algae in the splash zone above high tide mark are fed and watered by the spray. In the shallows, the kelp comes to life. Elsewhere on the shores of the Indian Ocean, coral reefs are the norm, but here there's a kelp forest, renewed every year as the cold water comes in. Deeper down, where the water stays cooler all year round, the kelp forest is permanent. The fish which live here are camouflaged to match the mottled brown leaves which surround them. A Murray eel foraging among the rocks is a potent force in maintaining that camouflage. Any fish that is too conspicuous will be eaten. Even down here, the riches brought by the Karif feed new growth. The stage is set for an explosion of marine life later in the year. As the waves thunder on the rocky shore, the warm wind that drives them reaches the land as clouds of mist and drizzle. There the transformation is complete. Where dust and drought held sway, now everything is green thanks to the magic of the misty reef. But another transformation is beginning. Its agents are goats, the most destructive of all mankind's domestic animals. The flocks kept here supply milk and meat to their owners and produce some income when they're sold in the towns. They also supply status, and that's where the problem lies. The flocks are bigger than they need to be, and their impact on the vegetation too is unnecessarily hard. As well as grass, goats eat the leaves and young twigs off the bushes. Eventually, they will kill them. At this time of plenty, it's easy to ignore the damage that the goats are doing. The rigors of the dry season are forgotten as welcome drizzle cloaks the hills and awakens the flowers. The 
drizzle gathers into small streams, many of them only temporary, a phenomenon of the wet season. The streams run together at the bottom of the slopes and gush into water holes which are dry at the other end of the year. African silverbills sit out the humid middle part of the day over one such short-lived waterhole. They're not the only Africans in the area. The Jibali people came here from Ethiopia hundreds of years ago. They speak their own language, not Arabic. They brought the cattle and goats with them from Africa. The position of camels here in Oman is rather odd. This is where they were first domesticated by the Arabs. Originally, when they were used as beasts of burden, they were fed on the low-lying pastures near the sea. But today, the old order has broken down and camels are fed wherever they can be driven, often in the vulnerable forests on the escarpment above. The damage done by a herd of camels is scarcely repaid by their only remaining function, which is boosting the social standing of their owner. Like goats, they will destroy all the vegetation, turning the forest into an extension of the bare mountains which lie behind the fertile coastal strip. Where freshwater streams reach the coast, they create a unique environment known as a core. It's a freshwater lagoon trapped by the beach which divides it from the sea. The core provides a feeding place for migrant birds of many kinds. Greater flamingos visit from Africa and Iran during their non-breeding season. Herons come here too to take advantage of the short-lived abundance of the core. As autumn arrives, snipe pass through on migration. The Karif is nearly over and the season is once more on the turn. The core is shrinking and drying, and time is running out for many of the birds and other animals that use it. The wind is dropping, and the sea has calmed down, a warning of the long, dry season to come. Big changes are taking place underwater. The kelp is beginning to die as the warmer water returns and the supply of nutrients from the open ocean begins to fail. This time of death is also a time of plenty for animals that can make use of the abundance of plant debris in the water and on the rocks. Abalone, large shellfish, come into their own. So too do the people who make a living fishing for them at this time of year. Abalone are very good to eat and highly saleable in the markets inland. They're regarded as an aphrodisiac which boosts their price, making abalone fishing a profitable trade. The divers go as deep as 20 meters in search of their prey without any artificial aids other than goggles and a strong knife. The water is as full of food as it will ever be, and shoals of fish come into shore to share in the feast. The tiny seedlings of next year's forest are already growing. Their growth will be arrested as the water warms up, and they will lie in wait for next year's cold influx when the Karif returns. Sea urchins graze on the old kelp as well as on the tiny new plants on the rocks. Brilliant blue and orange damselfish feed round them on the morsels which the sea urchins dislodge. But above all, it's the time of the filter feeders, worms and anemones which spread their fanciful, multicolored tentacles to reap the harvest of detritus floating past them in the clouded water.
Not all the colorful fancies are traps for food. Some are for breathing, the gills of a gorgeous array of sea slugs. giant planarian worm floats over the food supply like a red flag in a breeze. Sea urchins take advantage of the supply of food to spawn, converting the energy from the kelp into eggs and sperm. But a large part of their output will become food for all those filter feeders. The filter feeders are near the bottom of the food chain. As their populations expand, they provide a reliable source of food for small fish, which are preyed on by larger fish, and so on to the top of the chain. As the shoals of small fish gather and grow, they are eagerly awaited on shore as another aspect of the harvest provided by the Karif. Dead kelp washed ashore provides food for Sally Lightfoot the rock crab, which is so abundant around tropical and subtropical coasts. They are adapted to hang on whatever the state of the sea, and they'll eat whatever they can lay claws on. Rock skippers are small, highly adapted fish, which also forage at the edge of the water, sharing the generous supplies of food at the end of the Karif. Cormorants venture into the surf to take their toll of the small inshore fish. The young cormorants quarrel over the catch. This isn't a sign of shortage. Fish are extremely plentiful at this time of year. It's just in the nature of cormorants to pick a fight whenever they can. The shoals of sardines are too abundant for the cormorants to have any effect on their numbers. They are ready for harvest. is colossal. 
Using seine nets carried out from the beach, the local people drag in sardines by the ton. The catch along this coast is nearly 100,000 tons a year. They dump the fish unceremoniously on the beach where they will die and dry in the sun. Autumn has come to the land. Away from the oases, the trees and bushes are drying up and changing color. The sun is pushing the boundary of the desert towards the coast once more, now that the Karif is over. Those bushes which have survived the attentions of the goats are dormant, awaiting the return of moisture in the spring. Some plants, like frankincense, rose of the desert, and many acacias, flower at this time of the year in a most unexpected strategy. Though it seems strange, it works very well. Now that the land has dried, these flowers represent the only source of moisture for pollinating insects away from the permanent oases. Where other flowers go in for seductive scents and sugary nectar, these have only to produce water to bring the pollinators buzzing round their petals. Not long ago, this whole area was densely forested. That was before the cattle became so numerous. Some parts of the forest survive, but others are reduced to dust at this time of year. Where there are a few plants left, the herds are brought in to look for one last bite before the food disappears. Browsing the already leafless bushes, the cows continue the work of the goats. They destroy what little is left of the twigs which would otherwise have provided next year's fodder when the Karif returns. The herds of cattle and the flocks of goats are maintained and enlarged by government subsidy, but no subsidy can replace a forest thousands of years old. From the low-lying plains, which were once their province, the camels have been moved up onto the escarpment, and the cattle have encroached downwards from the traditional high-range lands. The result is plain to see. Unexpectedly in the howling wilderness, the magical oases still offer coolness and shade and the priceless gift of water. It last rained heavily and continuously in Oman 5,000 years ago. That was when the last pluvial came to an end. A pluvial in this part of the world was very much like an ice age without the ice. During that rainy period, the whole country must have been covered in streams, pools and lush vegetation. Then the water drained gradually away until only in a few low-lying spots such as this was there any left. The birds have been coming here ever since. Yeah. 
masked weavers are permanent residents. Each male builds several non-breeding nests during the year, but in the season of the Karif, he builds to attract a female to breed while food is plentiful. Kingfishers can live here as well, but hoopoos are migrants. They visit Oman on passage twice a year. The paradise flycatcher, cousin of a common African species, is another resident held here by the annual magic of the rains. The male has a glorious white tail. Humans may have lived here during the pluvial too, but they've only recently had such a severe impact on their environment. Now that camels have lost their original purpose and exist only as status symbols for their truck driving masters and domestic herds have grown far beyond the capacity of the land to support them, the time has come to rethink. And in Oman, people are thinking very carefully. No one is short of money to buy the amenities of the 20th century, but no amount of money will change the climate. There must be a way to reconcile a modern way of life with an environment so fragile and complex. The government supplies water pumped from ancient underground aquifers. Most of the water which nature supplies every year in the Karif goes to waste because so many of the trees which used to collect it have gone. So what is to be done? Here's one suggestion, metal trees. The function of the real trees is taken over by wire mesh screens which trap and drop the moisture in the same way, if less elegantly. The tanks hold enough to supply water to plantations where new trees are being grown, eventually to be planted out in areas which will be protected from grazing and browsing animals. After only a couple of years, the difference between overgrazed and ungrazed land is easy to see. When goats leave them alone, the twigs bear buds ready for the coming of the next Karif. Before too long, when the storm clouds gather and the wind gradually gets up in May, the Karif will return to a land with trees which will once more be able to make use of the generosity of the bringer of harvest, the wind of plenty.